Good morning, everyone. Welcome to all of you who are connecting to our debate on the European data strategy. Today, we'll discuss a data strategy for Europe from a future-proof perspective in the light of the upcoming legislative proposals from the European Commission and the European Parliament report on the European data strategy. Today's debate is hosted by the Rapporteur for the European Data Strategy, MEP Mia Petra Kumpula Natri. Mia Petra is an MEP with the SD Group from Finland. She is a member of the European Parliament ITRE Committee, where she focuses on energy and digitalization, and she is a member of the EIF Steering Committee. Good morning, Mia Petra. For today's debate, we have gathered different stakeholders who will share their views with us. And let me give you give them a warm welcome. Uh, welcome to our speakers. I will start with uh, Malte Bayer Katzenberger, Policy Officer at DigiConnect at the European Commission, where he is team leader for policies related to data-driven innovation. Welcome, Malte. We are also joined by Dr. Richard Benjamins, Chief AI and Data Strategist at Telefonica. Richard has ranked among uh, the 100 most influential people in data-driven business. He is also co-founder and vice president of the Spanish Observatory for Ethical and Social Impacts of AI. Welcome. And a warm welcome also to Adam Oharski, head of business intelligence at Santander Bank uh, Polska, who claims his primary job description is to transform data into money. Welcome, Adam. Adam is also a lecturer at the University of Wrocław and an active member of the European Banking Federation. Last but not least, let me welcome Eline Chivot, Senior Policy Analyst at the Center for Data Innovation, who will share the, her views as our first respondent today. Thank you all very much for joining us. We expect over 100 participants connecting with us today, including members of our forum, representatives from EU institutions and MEPs. As always, after listening to our host, uh, uh, MEP Kumpulanatri, and to our speakers, there will be an exchange of views with the audience. Uh, today, this will take place in the Q&A session area. You'll only have to click on the button on the left-hand side where you see Q&A session, or otherwise on the link that we will share in the chat box when the time comes. We are now all set to start. Mia Petra, the floor is yours. Thank you and, and good morning for everyone. Um, isn't it nice that we are together even uh, if it is on the screens? And I must say that we have all getting used to this one in the beginning. It was whether to start having the telco meetings or should we wait for the get together? And it was a very good decision from the EIF to start a, a series of these um, seminars online. And thank you, Maria Rosa and the whole EIF team for organizing this one as, as well. I'm happy to share with you some ideas on the data strategy uh, as it is now having very soon the last confirmation to be the, the report and then uh, uh, very soon we will have the timetable for the deadlines for amendments and so on. But uh, the, the big picture is that we all know that uh, the strategy commission gave out already in February. It was very timely even it was uh, a days or weeks before the whole COVID-19 really came into the knowledge of every European citizens. And it really shows the need for the readiness for the digitalization that is needed. And it really shows that it is not something on the businesses only or on the industrial scale, nor it's only on the, the platforms or the consumers and, and us as a citizens, but it is everywhere in the society. So uh, if we want to set a Europe as a fit for the digital uh, age, I think the right strategy is not to be passive and follow what happens in the markets, what happens in the innovations and, and companies, but we have to take the social uh, development uh, on board. And that's why Europe speaks a lot about the values and uh, what kind of society we want with the digitalization. But at the same time, we know that COVID also caused a, a difficult uh, economical situation. And we know that the digitalization is one uh, answer also to boost the economy and make the 
things better, the more quality decision with the help of AI and and then uh, also the uh, make more effective public services that they do not come too costly. And then the citizens expect that once they get something um, quick and online and, and uh, in real time, why not also the uh, services that are not usually uh, thing, thought as a part of the digitalization could be then uh, be online and or they could be uh, in real time. So I think the the idea where the commissioner uh, from the commission we have the speaker here, but then the, I support the idea that we need the the right framework and practices to make data flows to improve the society, both on the 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 quality of the living here and the quality of the services, the quality of the uh, products, but then also the serve the values you have set it for self. It is that it is the sustainable, it is uh, uh, modern, and it will uh, respect the, the values such as privacy and then also uh, more broadly the democratic uh, possibilities for uh, knowledge and information and not biased uh, strategy making. So the values and human rights and, and human centric AI, for example, are in the core all the time. So, but well, how to make the, the data flow uh, to, to be used then for the technologies and AIs uh, is uh, a key question in the data strategy. Uh, of course, one answer, which is the self-evident, is the infrastructure. And there Europe has been acting, and I, I personally was working for the, the code and, and, and telcos know that uh, very well. So then, of course, the also the RRF and then... Uh, in all, all the programs that we see for the recovery, uh, the promise that 20% will be for the uh, digitalization is, is a really an investment uh, boom that we can uh, not only to recover, but to build Europe for something uh, new for the next generation EU as the commission wants to put it. So uh, the, the infrastructure is not uh, enough and the technical solutions are not enough. And then the data strategy also looks for the different ways to uh, go further and, and take next steps. So uh, at this moment, uh, we are not delivering fully the European capacities and uh, therefore I fully support the initiatives here. Uh, and we need investments, clear and predictable rules for innovations to come and then also common practices uh, and most uh, importantly, based on the values and principles. Uh, so building the growth at the same time, uh, defining what kind of societies we want to live in. And it is not maybe good for Europe to wait a big company to dictate it or a big country to dictate it. But then uh, the build uh, markets economy also on the data that is good for uh, all the players as in the market we see that not matter big or small, you have some principles to respect. So uh, at the moment, very topical uh, time for the European data strategy. I'm uh, interested to hear the Maltese, the Bayer Katzenbergers, uh, what he will reveal on the EC uh, Commission planning uh, at this stage as we wait for the data governance and legislative proposal already uh in next week so i will not go deeper to that because my report that i left in already uh, in september is maybe lagging behind in the times table unfortunately it took this half a year in the parliament to decide which committee is in the lead but uh now 99 percent sure it should remain in itre uh, so uh, then anyway, there will be a lot of uh, MEPs working on the issue as it will be some shared competence with IMCO, Ayuri, Libe and Tran, and then still many more uh, like CALT uh, and AGRI and other committees are providing their uh, views on the issues. Uh, and then uh, I, as I mentioned, I already published uh, my draft I'm still very happy to participate here and listen to more, uh, as I also have the possibility to amend my own. And you know what was the very most difficult part uh, writing the draft? 
it, it was not to have the opinions, but it was to limit it to 6,000 characters. So last, last half a day I, I spent to cutting uh, away the sentences, make them shorter, because this uh, data strategy covers not only the data governance that Commission is uh, giving the first draft uh, the, for the legislative piece, but then also it covers the Data Act. And then, of course, we need that this triangular to work for the AI and data and infrastructure. I wanted to have uh, some comments on, the, on that. And then I also uh, work um, in the Parliament Standing Rapporteur for the e-commerce negotiations under the patronage of the WTO, with the 86 countries now negotiating international rules for e-commerce. So I keep on looking our internal possibilities, but then also the international uh, legislative uh, or agreements uh, if uh, Europe can deliver with the like-minded partners, partners uh, and then find a global setup for uh, e-commerce as well. So a few points I want to uh, take uh, up here uh, before I will give the floor to the others uh, that uh, I want to Europe to create a level playing field in the data economy so that the different players can take part. The different players have used, uh, want to use the opportunity to take steps to come into the data driven economy. So they feel that they also benefit when they start sharing data. Often the big play platforms say that the small uh, medium sized companies, they do not have the knowledge. They don't know how to do it, but I'm a little bit of Read that they might know and they don't just see the benefit of coming to themselves, but it is only benefiting the, the bigger platform. So that's why I want to see that, that there are uh, the ways that everyone supporting the chain will also uh, take part of the revenues. The second idea that the real time data flows also could uh, be good for the people to understand what are we doing here. Uh, why do lack on the in, why do we lack the online uh, or the I mean the, not online but the real time uh, data on so many decision making on the public side and and we uh, think for example the COVID now so when we have the statistical information that is official and, and finally improved it might be next year than when we can see the health uh, data from the January uh, 2020. So uh, this is maybe the uh, embedded in the thinking that we want to do with the data economy. But I think uh, starting to talk with the citizens about the real time uh, economy with the help of the data uh, and improved uh, the data handling also gives us the better basis for the decision making. That is one my motivation that EU could lead the way also, including the public. Uh, and then the societal uh, decisions on the on the economy from this uh, perspective. Then uh, on the uh, this uh, document, uh, the Commission proposal very much concentrates on the industrial data, as as even the figures are given that eighty percent of the data is not benefited at the moment, uh, or they are not really used. So then, uh, how to improve the the. Uh, readiness to open the data for the usage and then no, understanding that once you share the data it uh, has the value only then and not uh, not in the server when it's not used and only stored uh, it, it's not value for nothing for, not for the service not for the uh, income for the owner so uh, how to then uh, tackle the question on the um, um, data to be um, boost it uh, and then uh, here one uh, difficulty that I wanted to take on board to my report was the, the mixed data sets. The industrial data, it's cl quite clear if you read the x-rays, but then actually, yes, it is the containing my bones. So then uh, how much is that uh, uh, covered by the GDPR? And then I do not see the possibility to concentrate only on the industrial data, but I see that the GDPR must be respected all the time and very close even on the uh, 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 industrial data and then the readiness to see for the mixed data sets uh, needs to be there embedded in the, the governance and the rules that we do uh, so that uh, we do not also let too much data be unused uh, and, and later on it can be gathered with another data and, and later to be doomed then that okay GDPR uh, needs to be respected here. 
So for the final, I think the intermediate uh, layer and the edge are the, the keywords also to find the European way for the, the markets that it is not all central but nor is it all in the device uh, stored uh, and then used uh, uh, with with a monopolistic way but then i think the the more players will come when we have the intermediators uh, on on the market and also those intermediators can uh, handle the mixed data set so that is an answer for some uh, questions and uh, ideas that we do have so I look forward to the, the governance, governance proposal and, and especially these uh, uh, different nine uh, strategic uh, data spaces that will be created. And then I have the deep understanding that the exercise we are doing, it's not technical only, or, nor it is uh, policy making only, but it is both how the, the European data economy can be built and how the different players can take part. Of course, the research and governance and uh, ideas to test are all needed. And at the same time, we have to have the capacity, the knowledge on the different sectors of the life. For me, the data economy or the AI is not one uh, center of excellence, but it is uh, the policy that happens on the different fields of economy. And it's easier to uh, try to think uh, what sector might not have uh, data economy uh, or part of the data economy than what could not. So I think it's very uh, broadly taking on board and that is the need to also us to see that the governance and development is happening in different sectors and we need to, that's why also the uh, thinking the, uh, further with the nine different uh, uh, data space is the way forward to make it uh, the, the tools more specific. So with these words, I wanted to just open from my side and I'm ready to take the part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mia Petra, for opening this debate with your views as a rapporteur uh, for the European uh, data strategy. Not an easy job, for sure. Uh, let's bring in the European Commission point of view with uh, Malte. Malte, over to you. Good, good morning to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this, uh, in this discussion. It's interruptive. The streaming doesn't really help. Well, the audio doesn't go through. Yeah, it's been exciting times. I mean, the new commission took office on the 1st of December, and already in February, we could come up with a big strategy, which shows that the, the importance that Commissioner Breton, in our case, uh, attaches to the subject, and especially the fundamental nature of getting data governance right for anything. As you will remember, uh, as observers of the Brussels scene, that the previous focus has been on how do we tackle AI, also thanks to the uh, pushes that we got from the European Parliament to take this, uh, the challenges of AI a bit more seriously. But Commissioner Botton said, well, first we have to get it right how to organize the data, because ultimately also AI will, will need the data for that. So the strategy from February builds on the uh, assumption that we had already a first wave of data, which is personal data. The web 2.0 collected a lot of that, a lot of social media platforms that we know today uh, are basically organizing a lot of that data flow. But here comes now all the factories that will connect to the internet, all the farms that will connect to the internet of things, which has been a concept that has been around for a while. But I think now with sensor technology, connectivity and compute, plus the data analytic tools, these four elements, we can bring it really to life. And that will generate a massive new amount of data, most of which will be non-personal uh, in nature. And I think a lot of industry actors now look at lessons that they learn from personal data probably, and how that will translate into a, a viable business practice for the data that now they, they themselves uh, collect. And this, this raises a lot of questions. I mean, the first reaction seems to be, well, we heard now that they just need well, let's, let's keep it safe uh, until we know what we can really do this. So let's not share it with anyone. Let's keep it to ourselves inside different organizational departments of a company. But even if one company consolidates its data holdings, we'll keep it inside the, the company. We'll, we'll, we'll keep sitting and waiting. That's our, our uh, idea rebadges a lot of the the potential of the data seems to be in the reuse and that may be internal reuse within one company but not every firm 
does everything, especially in the uh, in, in the shape of the European economy, where we have a lot of medium-sized and small enterprises who are highly specialized, but never never are the conglomerates that you can find in other parts of the world. And I'm not only speaking about the US, but also certainly Japan and and South Korea, where a lot of firms have a, a, a large portfolio and there's a lot of inside firm data reuse. I think for you, um, the the nature of of the of the economy and of the data economy needs to be a lot more collaborative if you want to um, keep everyone in the game and not only let those survive who have to the, the power to construct walled gardens uh, conglomerates and that means that we have to organize sharing different firms and uh, now the key question is how to do such sharing uh, and i insist uh, on, on first on the on the thematic point that sharing is not apparently mean for free so sharing may indeed be data trading or monetization but sometimes you well you monetize against the service so many many models are possible why a company would like to actually give that to someone else because normally it should expect something in return that would be the, the, the first premise but secondly, even if it now arranges uh, for something to get in return, it also wants to have assurance that the data will really only do the purposes that they agree to. And there's a lot of discussion on the personal data side already on, in terms of can we encode users restrictions that would travel with the data, watermarkings, and all that kind of thing. And here I think still some advances have to be made also in terms of uh, machine executable uh, usage policies that would then automatically be uh, executable, but also maybe audible, uh, so that would give assurances. Um, and all of this in the perspective that those who currently have the data and hesitate to share would need to be able to trust that once they do so, no one will do something else with the data, not the party with whom they shared, and certainly not any of the third parties. And this of concerns. Uh, in this area. Martin, so yeah. Martin sorry to interrupt. We can, we uh, we lose you sometimes, so maybe the connection comes and goes. Uh, if you don't mind to turn your camera off, maybe that will improve the connection and we can hear you better. As oh, much I'll as we would to. love to see you as well at the same time, but uh, in the interest oh. of uh, of the clarity of your of your message, yeah, let's try this. Thanks for interrupting me. It's it's the broadband of the street, which is not very broad, actually. Um, <laughs> no, I, we understand. So, no problem. Go so ahead. Sorry I for think that. Be better I, now. <laughs> yeah, and, and thanks for interrupting because the, I can't read the I can't read the um, the chat at the same time. Of course. I'll not no. repeat. Go ahead. I'll not repeat much uh, because otherwise I will certainly overrun on time. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll just say that trust and fairness in the data economy of the future are essential for us. And now the question is how to organize fairness and trust. And one thing that uh, seems to be coming up quite clearly on the horizon, as we see it in many of the reports, are data institutions. So trustworthy institutions that help to organize data sharing, data flows, data pooling, uh, joint exploitation of the data. And they come in many reports, especially also in the AI reports on the UK, of, of France, uh, and also in the German Franco um, uh, Gaia X initiative, and that a lot of well, there's a lot of questions. How would you organize now if we have a, an ecosystem where there's lots of players? How do you make sure that we can get to data pools of a sufficient size that can inform machine learning? How can we actually make just the bilateral introduction function? Uh, so, in the governance proposal that uh, Mia Petra already alluded to will put a lot of emphasis on these new types of data intermediaries in the coming forms of marketplaces, but also in terms of IT platforms that can host local ecosystems and, and make sure that everyone abides by the rules and that no one is basically has to be concerned that the data will be used beyond what the company that made it available agreed to. But then there's also the question, how does the old data economy, the personal data economy learn well benefit from these evolutions because there's also distrust uh, um, on the personal data economy has been always around uh, Snowden Cambridge Analytica these were um, different waves of 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 uh, an ease that were spread about uh, practices that were prevalent without singling out the intentions of any any actor here 
but just that the the way in which we organize uh, data governance for personal data seemed rather imperfect despite all the rules and regulations in place and schrems 2 uh, also reminds us again on on the important also to look very carefully into national data flows so i think here finland brought us uh, the my data movement which is really to say uh, having rights under GDPR is good. Having the tools to exercise them as swiftly as we download an app on our phone is even better. And I invite everyone to look uh, at the My Data white papers, and I can uh, that explains a lot on on this type of approach. So we we certainly do not only look at parts at the non-personal data economy, although we we say that there is this coming wave of of industrial data which we should not even forget even if they're not so much in the public popular debate because very little people can 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 relate to a tractor or to a machine and to the concerns but we certainly um uh should also look at the the personal data economy allow me one one little side remark i feel that companies which are now thinking about data sharing of their non-personal data would sometimes feel that the safeguards that the GDPR brings to individuals should also apply to them. In the old economy, that was very simple. You basically could control everything by contract, non-disclosure agreements, and technical uh, technical arrangements. But the interconnectedness of, of factory shop floors puts this really to a huge challenge, and we will have to see how that pans out over time. Um, the The data sharing and the data sharing institutions are very important and they're one component of what we see uh, uh, or we would like to emerge as data sharing spaces or common European data spaces. Now, the, I'd like to just take two more minutes to explain that this concept is not meant to set up a new type of platform necessarily, but it's more an organizing concept that actors in a specific domain or sector or even across sectors now should organize a data governance partly on legislative rules, but a lot of also own set rules in terms of contracts or uh, code of conducts, uh, which then also have to not only be legal rules, but also have a technical reflection. I already alluded to the, uh, the question, can you reflect uh, usage restrictions in uh, um, policies that travel with the data and can be automatically executed by machines? There's a lot of intersection of law and technology here. Uh, and that these data spaces would then be an encompassing organizing concept where people agree to a common set of norms, and this would lower the cost of data transactions within the space at large, whether it happens on one platform, on several platforms, or completely decentralized, as also Mia Petra said, where all the actors basically say, well, I mean, if you want, we would want to do a federated machine learning, let's say. We all have now a, a protocol according to which we accept a learning algorithm to come to our data, and according to which we send back the learning results. So no data are going to be pulled anymore at all, because we now have a set of agreements that will allow us to do federated learning among actors who are not connected at all today. And that would be also one of the possible outcomes of a common European data space. So the nine spaces are by no means a closed list. We will probably see more where those where we see most readiness inside the commission and in the stakeholder community to set them up. But everyone should be invited to actually now organize a sector, including all the industry stakeholders say, we'll make a first move. Uh, don't wait for the commission. Don't wait certainly for commission money because money will be uh, not the solution to everything. And if there's a commercial uh, interest to actually jointly work on data, um, I think it's it should be so interesting for industry to just get it going and then work with the commission, especially on the cartel side, to get it safe and maybe to use certain of the tools that we want to uh, foster the emergence of which we want to foster under the data governance framework. And that's, again, the data institutions that you may need to organize your data space. I might pause here and I'm looking forward to the debate later on and hope you could hear me uh, during these last minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Malte. Yes, we could hear you uh, very well for your last uh, part of the speech, but um, I'm sure that uh, if any clarifications are needed, uh, uh, we can catch up uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, now, I would like to give the floor to Richard uh, with Telefonica. Let me remind all speakers that uh, uh, it would be best to stick to five minutes so that we have enough time for uh, an exchange of views with participants uh, uh, that we follow. Richard, over to you. 
Yeah, thank you, Maria, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, our experiences on, on uh, data sharing and European data strategy. Just to, um, to remind you of some of the activities that uh, Telefonica and myself have been involved in. Uh, I was a member of the uh, European Commission's expert group on business to government sharing uh, with a lot of discussions and insights on how to grow yeah, business to government sharing. Um, I'm also the founder of a big data for social good department within Telefonica, where we share uh, non-personal data for the greater good with humanitarian organizations, etc. Um, and within Telefonica, we have a business unit that is actually doing data sharing as a business where in the past, uh, maybe three, four years, we've done over 600 projects. Yeah? So we have some experience in what it means in practice to share uh, data. Uh, that uh, we believe that uh, the European data strategy is very important. We really welcome it. Uh, today, in general, data sharing is only at the beginning. So you can think of data sharing as four different types of data sharing. Yeah, it's business to business, it's business to government, but it's also government to business and government to government. Yeah, the last two uh, are in the in the scope of open data and. Even there, where there is a lot of data available, uh, not so much, there's not really an ecosystem yeah, that, that supports that sharing at a large scale. Yeah? Well, the data is available. So it's not a matter of only making the data flow and make the data available. It is above all of making that data used others yeah, to create a thriving ecosystem uh, that really makes the difference. Yeah? If we don't manage to build a thriving ecosystem, then it really uh, it will not uh, take off. Now, uh, as I said, European data strategy is very positive, very important, but there are also a lot of uh, open issues and open questions. Yeah? And I just want to list some of those questions to see uh, that a lot of things have to be defined. Yeah? And it's not even clear who should define them before this strategy really can be executed. First of all, First of all, is the, the data spaces. Yeah. So how will they function? Is this a marketplace? Is it a repository of data, a trusted intermediary? And we heard just that uh, Malt spoke about data institutions. Is it a data institution? Yeah. We also believe that a certain <coughs> role, organization role is very important. It's an organizational data steward, somebody who within companies and within public administration knows what data is available in the company to establish these uh, partnerships and ecosystems with, with others. Yeah. And who will determine the rules uh, to operate and govern the data space? Is that industry? Is it the public-private partnership? Is it the European Commission, the expert groups? Yeah. And who decides what data should enter in a certain data space? So there are several data space, some, most of them vertical based on sectors. Uh, but some of them cross, like the green data space. So who decides? Yeah? Is it free uh, for companies and, uh, and public administrations to put in their data? Or is there some government? Is there some obligation? So that's all uh, undecided yet. Yeah? And then who, who decides who can use the data? Uh, imagine you can use data in a data space, combining different data sets for a lot of good things. But you can also use it for, let's say, illegal things or even bad things. So is there a governance around that is there something that decides or that checks that actually the, the data use is going to be used in an ethical way and the question is uh, how do you how do we proceed to build this tracking ecosystem yeah how do we incentivize all stakeholders to participate is it through funding uh, through obligations uh, tax measures so there it's we have to do something yeah, to create this thriving ecosystem What's the business model underlying it? Yeah. Uh, what's the incentive for a data provider to put in the data? Because once it's there, there are others who can use the data and they might even compete with the one who puts the data. So in summary, there are many, many open questions that have to be answered. Yeah? Some at the horizontal level, others at the sectorial level before those data space can really kick off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. And now uh, over to Adam, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
thank you very much for organizing this event and inviting me to participate. I work for Santander Bank Poland and uh, I'm leading the business intelligence area where I am working, my team and I were working on uh, data-driven solutions to improve financial services for our customers. And I would like to share with you two use cases the, which I hope will illustrate uh, the importance of the data, in, 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 especially in these days. One of the key roles that the banks are playing in the, um, the economy is to provide the financing for different investments via uh, loans granted to the different entities or individual customers. In order to grant a loan, we need to answer the question uh, if the customer is going to repay it. And in order to do that, we need to understand the um, way the customer behaves uh, in terms of the context of the loan. Uh, so let me uh, let me take the example of small medium enterprise uh, working in the uh, e-commerce business. Without understanding the behavior of this company, the position of this company in this e-commerce sector, we won't be able to grant a loan or to make a, a robust decision. Uh, I've seen many cases where the traditional approach, just looking at the financial statement or uh, or traditional uh, questions related to the running the company would lead to negative decision and only thanks to in imposing under of course the customer uh, agreement the data from the e-commerce sector about this company the financing was uh, pos was uh, was possible so taking into account that many of the traditional businesses and uh, go is going online and there is some uh, new types of businesses derived from the digital revolution i think it's crucial to have an access in the context of uh, granting loans to, to customers, to have an access to the data which describe the sectors the companies or individuals op are operating on. The second example is related to the other role uh, of the banks uh, to make sure that the customer financial assets are safe. And let's take the very simple example of individual customer uh, logging into his current account via online service we need to distinguish if it is the real customer or not the robot, and if it is the owner of the account to prevent from phishing. In order to do that, uh, it's, it's the best way to compare the regular behavior of our customer with unusual behavior or robot or hacker trying to steal the money. Taking into account that there is a growing, uh, growing number of phishing attacks, this is something which we need to develop more sophisticated way uh, in future to prevent our customers from being uh, vulnerable for the phishing activities. So in Santander Group, we have invested a lot of time, money and effort to increase our capabilities in data understanding, processing and embedding them in practical applications in our services. And we find it a crucial thing for the today's and future existing of the financial sector, and to be honest, any other sector uh, operating in the digital world. In terms of uh, data strategy, I strongly support it, and I think it's very good direction. And I would like to point out the two things. Uh, the first one uh, is the customer centricity. Uh, I believe that there is no big difference between the financial asset and the data. And like in the financial world, this is the customer who makes the final decision what to do with his financial assets. And I believe the same approach should be uh, applied to the data strategy, that the customer should make the final decision and only one decision where he would like his data to be used and what to do with his data. That's, that's the one thing. And the second thing, the cross-sectoral approach. It's, I strongly support it as uh, we as a financial sector, we are financing customers from different sectors. These sectors are interacting each other. So in order to make it possible to understand the, the customer behavior, like in my example, uh, we need to have an access to this data, of course, under customer consent and approval and for the strict purpose of performing financial activities. Uh, I think it's the, the key thing to, to be possible to make a good decisions, not only credit decisions, but all the decisions related to the financial aspect and financial services. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Adam, for uh, sharing your perspective from uh, the banking uh, sector. Now, um, I would like to bring in Eline, who's going to be our first respondent. Uh, Eline, any comments after listening to our speaker's remarks? Thank you, Maria Rosa, and thank you for the invitation. Obviously, there is a lot to unpack here, but I'll stay focused uh, on the specifics of this session lined up before, uh, so I try to stay within the five minutes. Uh, first, contributing with some ideas on how to facilitate B2B and B2G data, data sharing. We know a lot of companies don't engage in B2B data sharing. Um, and why is that? Well, that's, you know, privacy concerns, uh, IP issues, trade secrets, the fear of misappropriation of the data, uh, considerations of commercial strategy, um, the lack of demand uh, for a company's data, and of course, the uncertainty about safety, security, the liability conditions um, related to the technical process of sharing data. So just to say that I think we all agree here, uh, including with MEP Kumpula, that there are some issues uh, that are there and, that, and you know, could become obstacles even more to data sharing. And if you look at the data strategy, the way it stands, some things indeed require clarification as they uh, remain undecided, as Richard said. Uh, and some things should be kept in mind. So yes, there are risks uh, related to legal uncertainty and compliance costs. So what happens when your data sets like in the healthcare or financial services um, data space would be mixed with personal and non-personal data and that can be costly to separate them. So we need clear guidance and governance about compliance. And you know, you have some sort of um, regulatory double think here. The GDPR limits to some extent the collection of data, of personal data and processing, but this idea of data sharing encourages it with the data strategy, yet there will be arbitrages case, case by case that will be necessary and that will add complexity to companies. And data portability can also be costly and um, that should be factored in a bit better, which wasn't the case in the GDPR. Uh, if we want uh, companies to take more than uh, a superficial interest in supporting the data spaces, there will have to be a clearer business rationale and incentives uh, for contributing data that was closed until now, and it shouldn't become pay to play or too costly or time consuming. And those that are running data institutions and indeed um, who will be these intermediaries uh, would have to ensure transparency uh, about the costs, communicate clearly uh, for, um, you know, about the value offered to stakeholders and demonstrate uh, the impact through evaluations. Um, Malta and others refer, refer to trust. It's important to consider the different methods that exist for data sharing and enhancing trust. So you have third party assessments, certifications and audits, and some are better suited for certain sectors and circumstances. So what works to create trust for data sharing and finance might not work in healthcare or between two organizations sharing data directly versus those doing that uh, within an ecosystem uh, via an intermediary. Next, um, we should experiment with smart data initiatives, data trust and other voluntary data sharing models. I'd refer here to the UK national strategy on data recently released because these models really can help to improve uh, data quality uh, and also the, um, can encourage businesses to share and collect data more responsibly. Uh, one more point. Um, it is that it's not always useful to share data as such. The expertise also matters. And there's not just one type of data. There are many millions of different data sets covering different and unrelated types of things with different applications. So the pooling and overlap and cross application of those data sets does not always uh, make sense. Uh, Adam referred to the individuals that would be in charge of decision making. Uh, they would need certainly first to have more literacy and better knowledge um, of things and tools if we expect them to make those decisions, I believe. Um, another point is the quantity of data matters, yes, but even more is the quality because that could address concerns related to data driven systems like AI systems we see with bias. Uh, Obviously, uh, interoperability remains an issue. Uh, it will be important to, to start by streamlining the adoption of common standards by all member states. We know how uh, EU information systems uh, lack the common standards and are fragmented. We've seen that with uh, medical data. We see that with high resolution geospatial data. One idea perhaps to consider is to use cooperative digital trade agreements and memorandum of understanding to ensure better data governance and interoperability. So you'd have partners identify opportunities to build data sharing frameworks between stakeholders um, in different countries on mutually beneficial issues. And that pre-standardization cooperation uh, would prevent things to be baked into all sides and politicized uh, you know, before it, you know, it can actually become a framework. 
Um, and one last point, sorry, uh, on, on, on mandating uh, data sharing, it's, it will be important to clarify and ensure data sharing isn't mandatory. Uh, sometimes some government initiatives may be helpful for that uh, by identifying industries where there are barriers to data sharing, for instance, but there are many examples of the private sector sharing uh, data already. You see that with pharmaceutical companies, there's a lot of existing coordination with industry, with codes of conduct and self-regulation frameworks, and some consolidation of that would be great to start with. Um, just as important is to emphasize more strongly IP as well in the proposals. So we know the idea is not to force uh, companies to, to give up proprietary data and trade secrets. Real quick, one last point I wanted to address on the um, anti-competitive behavior and how to address that. In some industries and markets, you have a small number of firms that have exclusive access to particular data sets. And so these companies uh, exploit their market power to limit access to that data through both technical and uh, administrative means without any legitimate business justification. You see that in real estate or in the air uh, travel industry. So a good framework to consider could be to evaluate, um, so to know whether to intervene. Uh, first, does the company have uh, exclusive access to data? Is the company limiting access to, to this data in ways that uh, harm consumers? Um, third, does the company operate in the absence of any legitimate business justification? Then you could use that framework through industry-led initiatives whereby um, stakeholders represented different business models. So banks and third-party personal finance apps, for instance, would oversee the decision-making process. And I'll stop here. I'm sorry I was super quick, but um, I hope uh, this was useful and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Aline. Very clear comments and thanks uh, to all the speakers. Um, I invite uh, everybody to uh, continue the conversation and allow uh, uh, a more interactive um, participation from the audience as well uh, in the Q&A session. Uh, participants uh, will be able to uh, join by clicking on the button. It's on your left hand side or otherwise in the link that we just shared with you in the chat box. So see you there in a second. <laughs>